Okay, everyone, we're recording. So welcome to our Read What You Want book club, long awaited, I know, because we missed, we skipped one last, last time. And so I'm guessing that we all have a whole, whole, whole bunch of books to recommend to each other <laughs> since it's been like three months since our last one, two months since our last Read What You Want. Um, how did, first of all, how did everyone enjoy our celestial phenomena yesterday? Yeah, that was great. It was amazing. It really was amazing. I couldn't, I, and you see, I was sitting there and then a, a, an elderly couple came sitting next to me. That's the only people we had. And I was sitting there and I, because I got there at two o'clock just to be sure I had a space. And then I was all by myself and I was reading a book. And eventually the lady said, you know, it has started. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting, you know, and, uh, but it was, it was amazing. It really was something. Yeah. I got very emotional. So did I. So did I. Yeah. I, and, know, I, and I thought, and I was so amazed at myself that I did. You yeah. know, I, because I have lost so many people, you know, in a very short time in my family, my mother, my son, my sister, it was all within eight, eight years of each other. And I was thinking, sitting there, I wonder if they can see it, you know, <laughs> which I got so emotional when I watched it. It was just amazing. But I got home. I was so tired. I slept for two hours afterwards. Oh, yeah. Well, all that emotion, watch, too. Where right? were it's you? Tiring. Where did you watch it from? I need a piece of paper. Uh, Heidi was watching it from a field across from her house, like at the top of Cavendish. It's not across. It's at the end. You see, I live at the end of Cavendish, you know where uh, Cavendish sort of ends where they always want to open it up. Well they're well they're um, here. And, and I just the books that they they favored would you write them down? Uh thanks a lot. Yes. I, I won't be That's a nice something awesome. Oh hi Rona. Okay. Rona oh. has arrived. How, how can you hear me? Yep. You can yep. hear me. I'm on. Yeah. You're on. Okay. <laughs> we can hear you. Welcome. We were just uh, talking a little bit about the eclipse, Rona. Oh my God! Which I just want to say, I yeah. went to Code St. Luke IGA. I happened to be there just at that time. There was nobody in the store but me and the employees. Oh. And Nobody, nobody. I think, what am I doing here? And we all rushed to the window and saw the turn. It was amazing. How about you guys? Did you see it? Karen, awesome. You... That's what we're all saying. Awesome. And uh, it, it was just, I also got a little emotional. I couldn't believe when it started to get dark. It wasn't like a sunset yeah. dark. And then it, it got so black. It was even blacker than at night. Yeah. Pitch black. And so cold. Oh, okay. I was inside. Oh, it got, it got quite cold. Were you outside, Katie, with glasses? Oh, yeah. and... before she twisted her ankle. What happened? Actually, just after I twisted my ankle, oh, I was really? on break. <laughs> yeah. Are you in a cat? So I was sitting there with my foot up. <laughs> quite the vision. But how was it to see it with the glasses? It was amazing. Oh, amazing. It. Amazing. And then once totality happened, so once the moon actually was covering the sun, you couldn't see with your glasses, right? Like you could, like you could see with your bare eyes, but the glasses, it was just black. Um, but the most interesting part, or well, I mean, I found a lot of things really interesting about it. And I'm a bit of a nerd about this kind of thing, but I the the diamond ring phenomena. Did you guys read right. about this or see it with your yes. glasses? So like it's totality happens and that there's just the corona and then like it felt like it was a second later then there was this almost like a flare on one side like a so that it looked like a diamond ring. Um so that like you could see the diamond part on one side. That's so it. Cool. 
It was unbelievable. Really, really was something special to see that everything get dark. It was like mind blowing. It really, I agree yeah. with you, Carol. It was emotional. You know, we're so little in such a big universe. You know, it was terrific. Really terrific. Really great. I thought, I, I really thought, and so did my husband and some other friends, I thought everything was going to get dark like at night. Yeah. I mean, I, I really did. I was shocked. I mean, it just, it got to be around seven, it looked like seven o'clock in the, yes. but I thought it was going to be black. Uh -huh. I mean, the way they were talking, everything's going to get black. Every, and that surprised me. <laughs> I was disappointed. Oh, no. <laughs> no, I was. I, I comes, <laughs> anyhow. Well, I expected it to be darker also. And because where I sat, you see, the sky was really blue yesterday. Especially mm -hmm. where I was, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. And we're so lucky with the weather. It kind of got darkish, you know, but I think it depended which end of, of the place you were sitting. I also I also found that it depends. I have problems with my eyes. And, you know, my daughter saw it. One saw it out in the Maritimes and the other mm -hmm. one saw it in Ontario. And they had a totally different vision of it than oh. I did, actually. It was very interesting. But it was and it should, I'm glad you said that because I didn't see the crescent either. Pardon? I didn't see like the, the crescent, the half moon or whatever. I well, saw it on TV. Yeah. You like you would have TV. had to have glasses really to, to watch to yeah. see the crescent safely. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. exactly. it's like the only time that you could, that it was safe to look at it with your bare That's eyes fine. or without That's the fine. very special glasses was uh, was during totality itself, which only lasted. Okay, but I was happy with what I saw and what I experienced. But you know what, the, I must tell you, it was strange because I drove to IGA and I drove back. There was nobody in the parking lot, nobody <laughs> on the streets. It was almost eerie at how... I said, what am I doing out here? I mean, I'm, I'm like, what? there was right. nobody anywhere, empty. Nobody the, on I, the I street. I into the parking lot. I said, hey? You didn't see anyone what? on the street? The cars, hardly anybody. And nobody cars, in yes. the parking lot. The parking no, but lot I saw, it, like, this was it. I went outside a couple of times, like, throughout those hours. And I just saw, like, all kinds of people just outside. Yeah, outside. and nobody yeah. was out like they were in their house looking out. Yeah, looking out. It was just absolutely phenomenal. But I got to become friendly with the people that work at IGA. It was just me and them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was hysterical, you know. <laughs> anyway, yeah. it was something to see. It was something. For sure. But listen, in nine in 2044, everybody, we're all gonna be able to see it again. Yeah, we're right. Katie, Katie, you're the only one who apparently it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be the next solar one is in a hundred years because I told my granddaughter. I it was eighty. Well, I told I her twenty forty four. I heard twenty forty four. I don't know. I think it might be a partial. Maybe a partial. Oh, maybe a partial. I don't know. Whatever. Anyway, it was quite the phenomenon. It was quite it was. an experience. Yeah. 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 So, can I talk about my art show now? Yes, Carol, talk about okay, your art so show before, before, we before, we get in, before we get into the books, I'm having a solo art exhibit. I have 42 artworks in oh. the library in the art book section. Oh. Oh. It's, on till, it's on till May 16th. They're for sale and the prices are really reasonable. I am supporting the Cats Committee of Cote St. Luke where they capture, neuter and release feral cats to keep the population down. Mm -hmm. So have a you look. until the 18th, and this, Carol? And May 16th. It's like five weeks. I can't believe it. And please sign my visitor's book. So, and also Mike Cohn, that's his pet project, pet, ha -ha. and uh, he wrote, he wrote on his blog, mikecohn.ca, a beautiful article. Um, oh. so I really appreciate that. Yeah. Well, and I'm I very proud. I bought a, a ring from Carol and I bought something else and I love that ring, Carol. I wear it all the time and get so many compliments. Well, treat yourself to a new artwork. Take down something old and put, back, <laughs> put on something new or give a gift. 
you know, anyway, it's, uh, it's spring, refresh. So I just want Carol, to say it, it, it's a beautiful show. I'm so proud your, of it. Yes. Carol, what's your last name? Oh, what is your, it, it, it'll be on the, uh, <laughs> when you go there, you'll see it. Because oh. we're public, that's why Katie took it off. Because you're what? I, oh, just because I take the last names off when we're when oh. we're recording. Oh, oh. oh right. I mean, it's okay. up to you, Carol, but you might want to share it because if people want to look up your artwork from the YouTube channel. Oh, okay. So it's Carol Rabinovich. And I'm on Instagram at carols.whimsy.art. Or, or but this is the nicest show I've ever had. Uh, it's bright. It's whimsy. It's fun. I, it's almost surreal. I am so proud of it. And I hope you enjoy it. And thank well, you for asking. Do you have a studio? Do you, have your, do, you, do you do it for your place or do you have a studio? Oh, well, I go to painting classes, but I usually paint at home. Uh -huh. And then I'll have my teacher sort of help me. She sees things I don't. So we sort of um, fix it up. Super. And some are from 20, some are 25 years ago. There's beautiful oil paintings, which I don't do oil anymore, in these heavy, gorgeous frames that somebody said they could be worth $100 today. So some are, not everything's whimsy. The older ones as I was starting. Anyway, you'll see. And I would love your feedback. Gail. Gail. Oh, uh, uh, can I tell him to call you back? Uh, or we will call him back. T tell her I'm watching Katie. Okay, and to know it, and, and call me back. Thank you, Carol. I I really have trouble, you know, understanding you people. I don't know some. I know my hearing isn't great. I mean, I'm just falling apart all over. But where is that exhibition? Coach Saint Luke Library in the oh, it's in the library. Center. Okay, well yeah. that's easy. I go to the library all the time. So Good. I just, and when does it start? It's on now. Oh, it's on now. Well, I haven't I haven't been. I haven't been feeling well. So okay. Oh, no. Feel better oh. and you still have a few weeks, a good few weeks. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's upstairs or it's somewhere down downstairs. Yeah, it's in the nonfiction section of the okay. library. So down the center mm -hmm. aisle. Okay. Nonfiction sec. You know, sometimes I need a, a a play, somebody to guide me through that library because I can never find anything. We can guide you. Just come and ask at the reference desk. Say, I'm looking I know, for an I art know. show. But I usually don't want to bother people. That's the problem. You know, but I go to, I sit in one of the rooms because the chairs are much better than in my apartment. <laughs> so oh. I go to the library <laughs> and I read some, some special magazines that I really like you know, some political stuff. And that's where I sit an hour or two, you know, at least twice a week, because it's really nice there. I agree. Yeah, it's really nice. <laughs> anyway, I have a girl here who does some cooking for me. So can I start with my book? Sure. Yes, I was going to say, let's get started and talk about our book. Yeah. What do you got, Heidi? I just finished The Girl Who Smiled Beats. What? Say it's the girl. girl Who Smiled Beats? Yeah, The Girl Who Smiled Beats. It's an autobiographical story about uh, a young woman, I mean, a young girl that has to, with her sister, she, she has to flee the genocide in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. And... What's it's, the last word of the uh, the girl who smiles? What? Beets. 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 Like the beets? red, like oh, the red root vegetable. Yeah. Oh, beets. Oh, yes. that's what I. Okay. Spell that. Beets. Beets. B -E 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 yeah. E T S. Yeah, it's hard to understand oh, what you say. Yeah. Okay. Beets. It's it's written by that particular woman. She was six years old when she fled with her sister who was 15 and they were on the roads in different camps for seven years all through Africa through and then she got adopted kind of in the states 
and she's trying to come to grips with her life because you know she she saw so much disaster and also it's it's a very interesting book i just finished it the day before yesterday and i haven't quite come to grips with it yet oh. uh, it was a hard book to read it's fairly new i think it was published maybe three years ago two years ago and sorry everyone it's the girl who smiled beads B-E-A-D-S. Yes. B-E-A-D-S. Beads. Yeah, beads like on a necklace. Yeah. And you know, with the 30 years after the the genocide in Rwanda, it was a very good book to read. I also saw a couple of interviews with Dallaire, you know, General Dallaire. Dallaire, yeah. And it's a very interesting book, but it's a hard, I found it was a hard read, mainly mm -hmm. because when she's finally in the States and she she graduates from Yale eventually, and she's an advocate for refugees, basically. But she had a hard time coming to grips with her own life. She really has a hard time adjusting. That to sounds pretty intense. She gets in the States. It's a very interesting book. Uh, it's not an easy read, I found. Not so much the time when when they're on the road, but afterwards she has so many psychological problems. And the other book I read is totally different. It's called The German Heiress. Heiress. It's, it takes place in... 1946, just after the war, and it's it's about the daughter of a, a big industrialist who is already imprisoned as a war criminal, and she's wanted by the she. It, it's a it's a town in in the British section of of Germany after the war, and she's wanted also if as a Walking up by one particular British British soldier or whatever they are. And it also was very interesting because she actually was her father put her in charge of you know all the the workers that they had taken prisoner and were working in their in their mines. They had coal mines and they were making steel and of course you know everything was sort of uh regulated by the regime and she tried to help a bit but she was still she still was wanted as a war criminal because she was in charge of these these people and of course you know a lot of them suffered a lot and it talks about you know because she really wasn't a nazi but they were all they all had you know they were part of the party. I mean, this was part for the court course at the time. And, uh, you know, she feels a lot of guilt and she's she's fleeing mm -hmm. to get taken prisoner. And eventually she got, gets caught and she's actually looking for a friend who mm -hmm. disappeared. And eventually she finds out that the Gestapo killed her. So... It was very different for me. It was very, very relevant because, you know, I lived through that time and I know what was happening. Mind you, I found out most of it when I came to North America because we didn't hear anything in school about it, obviously. Um, yeah, that's the other book I read. It's by Anika Scott. She is a journalist in the States and she actually is married to a German and lives in that town where she described the story, describes the story, but it's a novel. And nice. a young Good recommendation. Friend. Pardon? Good recommendation. The. I didn't, you know, I really have a hard time on the, on the screen to hear you all. I don't know what oh, to do. Sorry. Now. Sorry, yeah, I think it's, it might be my computer. Um, I said a good recommendation. I'm still couldn't understand. It's okay. Yeah, I understand. 
It's okay. Okay. Today it's particularly bad. I should probably get my hearing aid. My yeah. help. <laughs> I have. Is everyone else okay. able to hear things okay? Yeah. Yeah. I don't okay. suggest a book because I can't stay all that long. It's Carol with an E. Um, <laughs> I've already discussed it with Carol without an E, and I, she wasn't entranced by it. It's called The Women. Carol, oh. who's by, because I don't remember. But Her good I things. Heard it. Anna. I, I heard Anna. It audio because I haven't been reading as much as I'm used to. I have to tell you, it's the story of the, unfor the, the forgotten uh, veterans of um, Vietnam War. Um, mm. It's about the women. And um, here's a woman who's telling her story and she um, needed help. She really, she had, you know, stress, unbelievable stress. She was not getting along well. And when she went to the, the veterans, uh, I don't know, uh, whatever place asking for help, they said, there are no female veterans. There's no such thing as a female veteran. And it was a very interesting um, take on what went on in the women's side as opposed to the man's side. She was a nurse. And I just found it very interesting. I had been to Vietnam. I had seen uh, locations. I had heard of things that had gone on. And it, it, it's just, it was, an, it brought back all kinds of memories about, you know, for my trip. But anyhow, I think it's a worthwhile read because we see a side of Vietnam that we know nothing about, um, how the women were, it wasn't possible that there were women fighting the war, but they they were very important in the hospitals. And uh, I very, I really do recommend it. The end. Okay, so <laughs> Carol, I it, things. I heard very good things about that book. There, there, yes, and it tells you all about the nurses in the army and how she treated the 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 injuries and the whatever, but that was also because too, the Carol? connection. Pardon? You read it too? Yes, yes. yes. She's a, so she's a because, Carol, I discussed it with. So because it's fiction, she also put in her love life, and that's where I was disappointed, to tell you the truth. So, but but everything she talked about brought back memories of the Vietnam War and then the. Um, activists those who were against it so it also brought back memories it it was like sort of historical but again it's fiction and um it's a bestseller i mean i think there's 59 people on reserve for it i was lucky i got it and um like i say i don't want to spoil anything but i was disappointed in the end with her boyfriends so you know but otherwise it was it was excellent like carol said well, as, uh, as I had said to Carol, I didn't read it for the romantic aspect. I read it for the historical. Uh, you did it? Yeah. How could you? Carol, <laughs> Carol without an E reads differently than Carol with an E. <laughs> I read everything. Is it, is it I... historical fiction? Is it historical fiction? Yeah. I would yeah. say so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I would say so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very no, bad. I recommend it. I recommend Every... it. Carrie has something to contribute. No, I just, I was, when we're finished discussing this, I wanted to see if I could go next because I wanted Carol with an E, <laughs> I think, to hear, because I think she might be interested. So. Thank you. Do I, it up. Do it up, Carrie. Are Carol you finished, e Carol? She only had the one book to talk about. Well, I don't, I do too, because I didn't know how it worked here. In other words, I didn't know. So I thought we we're supposed to bring a book. So I brought a book. And the interesting thing is, I purposely haven't read it. I, there's a reason. <laughs> it all makes sense. Okay. So it is called Change Your Brain Every Day. Oh, dear. Okay. And I. Now, why did you say Carol would need it? Mm -hmm. uh, because we once <laughs> had a conversation. <laughs> and why do you think I'm reading it? Yeah. <laughs> so anyhow, I don't buy books unless for work I've had to buy books. But other than that, I don't buy books. Um, I only use the library. As a child, my memory of my father, when I think of my father, it's always him coming home in the house, carrying 
books, tons of books. <laughs> and every week going back to the library, returning with tons of books. So I use the library, but for this, you have to buy the book. Well, you don't have to, but I think it was it. So I actually, for my birthday, I told my sister she wanted to get me something. I said, okay, you can buy me the book. So, okay, bought it. So I'm just going to read, a, you know, just a, 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 bit, a bit, okay, just a, an absolute bit. It said, you are, oh, you are not stuck with your brain that you have. You can make it better, even if you have been bad to it. And I can prove it. You can literally change your brain. And when you do, you change your life. Okay. So um, then it says, I recommend you read a page a day. It'll only take a few minutes, but over time, it'll change your life as oh. if, as you learn to think about and practice brain and mental health every day for a year. Just as I encourage my patients to lose weight slowly, so they develop the lifestyle habits that will help them stay trim and healthy the rest of their lives, establishing these brain and mental health habits one at a time will help them last. So the book has 366 pages or chapters or whatever, and it's 366 in case you started in a leap year. <laughs> ah, fabulous, fabulous. So, Sounds like an, is it like a self-help book? It's a self-help book. I, I, well, I assume it's self-help. Yeah. You're learning, you're learning right. things that are going to help you. Yeah. So I did start today. I figured I'm starting today. I wrote down the date. And one year from now, we're going to have a <laughs> book club. We're and gonna you're for coffee. I'm going to be I'm going to be taking Katie's job over. <laughs> okay, you're you'll experiment. Good. Right. We will get back to you in a year. <laughs> so it's if we Carrie, remember. What's the name again? I mean, Carrie, the, what's, what's the great? name? Is, uh, pardon me. What in the name of the book again? Okay, please. it's called Change Your Brain Every Day and it's by you probably know the name, Daniel G a, is, is, I don't know if he pronounces amen or amen. A M E N. He's on public he television. A scientist or a psychologist or what is he? I, you know, I've seen him so many. I think, I think he's a psychiatrist, but I'm not sure. I've seen him many times on television. He's written many books. But what's great about it is that every day you it will become a habit, and you can do all your normal reading and still just do this every day. I thought it was interesting. So I'm Katie, going to- what, what would the um, late charge be if you kept it out for a year instead of two? <laughs> <laughs> I believe it would be a maximum of $10. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, cheaper so, than buying it. So just to answer that question earlier about who Daniel Ammon is, he is here, it says that he's an American celebrity doctor who practices as a psychiatrist and brain disorder specialist as director of the Amen or Amen Clinic. And he's a five times New York Times bestselling author. Hmm. Sometimes I'm skeptical of those, you know, I don't know. It's like all yeah. I'm, I'm a little bit. I think skeptical. when we hear celebrity doctor, yeah, we're like I know. our spidey senses. <laughs> Maybe it'll work. We'll see how Terry is in a year. <laughs> if she's got your job, we know it worked for sure. <laughs> Although from my perspective, Terry's brain seems okay to me, but we'll have to take her word for it. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Well, then you know what? I'm gonna. I hope you don't mind me going next because Carol, Carol with an E, you wrote a book. You read a book called Women. What was it called again? The women. The women. The women. So I read a book called Women Talking. I don't ah, know what the, Women Cain. Talking. Yes, it was so fascinating. It's a true story about a Mennonite women living in a um on the Manitoba colony in Bolivia, not yeah. Manitoba. And it was made into a documentary film also. It's a true story, but well, it was it's like yeah. historical fiction. Like she makes it in, she, it's about women who 
live there. They're completely illiterate. They don't know how to read. It's real women living in this colony, you know, with riding the red with the, the black buggies and everything. And while they were sleeping for about three years, they the men, their their brothers, their fathers, their, their sons came in, drugged the women with a with a horse uh, whatever, drugged them with a horse tranquilizer and raped them for three years, even the three and four year old girls. And they and when the women they couldn't figure out what happened, they thought they were dreaming. Some got pregnant, uh, some got STDs. It's a true, true story. And it's a story about how they had to decide what they were going to do about this because they were men and night women and they weren't uh, educated. And they either had three choices. They were going to do nothing, which they didn't want to do. They were going to stay and fight with knives or they were going to pick up and leave. Those were their three choices. And the book is, is about how they talked about those three choices. And one of the men in the, in the, in the uh, colony wrote down everything they said because they couldn't read. And, and they had to have somebody transcribe their thoughts. And it was, it's really, it's mm -hmm. unbelievable. It, it, it's like a true story. But like, I think, Katie, it was like, uh, how does she know what happened in these conversations? Like, you know, that part of it. Yeah, but it's it, definitely it's, fictionalized, but it's based yes. on, like, it's it's based Have on true events. Have you heard of it? Did events. you hear of it? I read it, yeah. And it is oh, very what did affecting. You think? Because, because part of it is, like, also how they deal with how they, as a group of women, are dealing with this experience also in relation to their beliefs because exactly. because if they don't forgive they're not going to go to heaven they're not going to go to and heaven. also That's like the way thing. that their community their belief in god the way that yeah. everything is sort of organized it, it's um i mean miriam taves is one of my favorite authors I oh think my god i'm absolutely astounding i love her um, oh this it's, was unbelievable it's an, intense, unbelievable it's an intense book i have not seen oh, the movie um, and, and you it know, has you great have actors it. in it and I think Sarah Polly directed, I think. It was one. a very good, yeah. Uh, I saw the documentary. It was one, yeah, they had some excellent actors. Yeah, it's in not it. a, or, well, there's a movie. There's a movie. It's not a documentary. It's a movie, uh, yeah, movie. yeah, that's true. It's it's a movie. It won some, but, it won some awards, I think. Uh, I think it won a couple of Oscars. But when I How read the book, it? I, How did you come to it, Rona? You know what? I'm in another book club and, and they throw books around and it gives me an idea. Like in this book club, you throw ideas around and it gives me, the, and that's how I heard about it. And I just, I didn't think I would like it, but it is just fascinating. Uh, you liked it too, Katie. I'm glad you read it and you liked it. Yeah. And I find this type of book, and the more you read it, the more you get out of it, the more you understand the way other people, women think. And, and in this day and age, how women are so oppressed, you know, like they are like slaves. They live like slaves. They have nothing. They have nothing. They live like slaves. Well, on. And especially, again, like it gives us insight into another culture that we don't have mm -hmm. an inroad into, right? Like that's we talk about this a lot in our, in our, in this book club is like why we read. And it's to, uh, oftentimes we talk about like getting these different perspectives on life, on different experiences, on different historical events, um, lived experiences. Yeah. Excellent. I think Good. Us that. I'm going Thank to read you. another. What do you recommend from her, uh, uh, Katie? What else do you recommend? Well, my favorite of hers is The Flying Troutmans. Um, oh. That one is, it's uh, it's a little bit lighter, I guess, and fair. But I've I've pretty much loved every book of hers that I read. Really? Wrote oh, one so called um, All My Puny Sorrows. Oh yeah, that all my puny sorrows. Yeah. That's what, yeah. So all my puny sorrows is sort of um, seemingly anyway semi autobiographical, like it's a fictionalized oh. kind of autobiography, uh, and it's about suicide. So just as a warning, 
<laughs> All these happy stories. <laughs> yeah. So Miriam, Katie, to... did you do oh. a book club? Did you do a book club at the women's, uh, uh, the Cote St. Luke Women's Center on on that book or one of her books? Because no. no, the I think the one that you came to with the women's club was uh, that was Elizabeth Strout. Oh, and I was talking okay. about like a name, bunch of I remember her you books. talking about. Uh huh. Okay. But uh, yeah, Miriam Taves is all my puny sorrows for me anyway. So. Okay, so Miriam Taves is both her father and her sister um, died by suicide. And oh. in this story, All My Puny Sorrows, both the father and the sister, like, anyway, these things come up. So I have to say that after reading that book, uh, recently, before that, an acquaintance of mine had had uh, died in the same kind of way oh, and wow. I've always found it really challenging uh, like a, an idea to grasp like I, I want to like, it, it really provided me I thought with a lot of insight and in, in more understanding more empathy for the things that ends up spurring people on in in those mm -hmm. ways yeah the pain hey, like hey. this is it like the pain that some people are living oh. with um, more of an understanding, or I don't know about understanding, but an empathy anyway, um, for that. And so less, I, I had, when I was younger, I think I had a lot more judgment mm -hmm. for that. Um, and I, I think that reading all my puny sorrows did a lot to open my eyes to, again, other realities. Oh, that I'm going to read that. I'm read that Katie, what was the flying what? The other the flying one? Troutmans. Troutmans, one word? Yeah. yeah. That's that's been my favorite of hers so far. Okay. The flying yeah. I'm gonna read one. I'm gonna read them. Yeah. All right, Carol, without any or Addie? Yes. Oh, does Addie want to go? No, I'm okay. Okay. Okay, dear. So I read two memoirs and two thrillers. First, I'll tell you about the thrillers. So there's uh, Frida McFadden, and I picked up her bestseller, The Housemaid's Secret. Apparently, mm -hmm. she's written many, many, but I didn't go in order, and I didn't have to. And it was a thriller, because it twists and turns. I read it in three days, and I loved it. So I decided to try another one of her books, The Housemaid. And I enjoyed it also just as much. So now all her books are on reserve. <laughs> what's, what's the author? What's the author, Karen? Frida, F-R-E-I-D-A, McFadden, M-C-F-A-D-D-E-N. I okay. highly recommend Frida McFadden. those two. But before that, I read two memoirs of two Jewish celebrities. One is Getty Lee, who is the my F in life. He's the lead, he's a Canadian. He's a lead singer from Rush. I don't think oh. they were that popular, but he talked about they are popular. They were okay. <laughs> so he talked about his life and how he got the name Getty. Is that his name is Gary, but his mother, who had a heavy Yiddish accent, called him Giddy Giddy, so that he couldn't say Gary. And that was his nickname. And he talks about his upbringing and also, you know, the band and how they got going and the whole thing. And it was very interesting. And then at the same time, being Henry by Henry Winkler, the fawn. That's, I hear that was terrific. It was fabulous. Yes. Give the name again. What is the name okay. again? Being Henry. Henry. Okay. Henry Winkler, right. I would put my name on the reserve. He talks also about his uh, Jewish upbringing. Right. His parents, his parents were mean to him because he was dyslexic. Dyslexic, can't even say it. <laughs> and um, it was like a a, 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 a a fluke that he was able to get on to being Fonzie. And... Um, Cunningham, what's his name? The one who, oh, he's so nice. Ron oh. Howard. Ron Howard. Howard. Oh, what a nice guy. But the producers wanted him to have more of a lead role. And he said, I can't do that. 
and he, he didn't. And they did become friends, but he always told Ron Howard, I never wanted to outdo you. And mm. he talks about so many Jewish things and Jewish expressions. I was like freaking out. I think I'm going to read it again. It was that enjoyable. Yes, we share, we share the same rabbi. His <laughs> rabbi confirmed. Yeah, his rabbi, he had his rabbi, then his rabbi moved to Utica, New York, and we had the same rabbi. <laughs> oh, oh, really? Oh, so, so you saw him, you knew him. No, 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 no. I knew his rabbi. His rabbi, oh, talked, his rabbi talked about it. He was my uh -huh. rabbi talked about him. Yeah. Right, right. And then later on, they both became uh, directors and they, yeah, and he talked also about some lean years where he needed to make money for his family. Anyway, like I say, it was it's a lovely written, good story memoir. That's nice to know. So that's Can it. I, yeah. I want to apologize. I usually don't answer phones, but my husband's brother has been very sick and my husband cannot get to the phone quickly. So when the phone rang, it was long distance, I had to take it. So I apologize. Yeah. Okay. No apologies. You might want to very sweet of you, talking Terry. about autobiographies, Carol, I wasn't even going to mention it, but I did plow through Barbara Streisand's a thousand page oh, book. Yeah. It took me, I don't know how long to read about four hours, God knows five days a week or whatever it was there. Because I read every word, I have to say, even though it sounds trite, but if Henry Winkler could be so good, which I heard it was fabulous, I have to say I thought her mem I thought her memoir was fabulous as well. I really do. It wasn't like just silly nonsense. She really goes into what she did, the thought she put into it. She's so amazing. I I think you if you you don't even have to like her to love the book but the book but it it was wonderful okay and so i have it I, yeah i have it on ebooks i keep forgetting about it but now i'm in between it's books. wonderful carol so i have to go back to it you know? the problem is when she she talks yeah. about making all the movies she made yeah you, mm -hmm. i you i went online to yeah. see what she was talking about and even her specials that she had in the 60s and 70s yeah. you go online she tells you what she did to make it like that she was unbelievable so it takes a long time because you look and see what is she talking about you know it was <laughs> fabulous I, okay I so really yeah. okay so there's a there's a small difference between a memoir and an autobiography yeah that's true you're right yeah this is, it's not her autobiography, but it almost is her autobiography, Carol, because she talks about as a child. Yeah, she goes I started it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's got like a little bit of everything. Well, thank you was, for reminding me. Love it. I'm going to go back to it. Absolutely. Love it. Can, can I ask a question about the difference between an autobiography and a memoir? I'm always wondering about that. What is the difference? Katie. Katie, you're the one to answer this <laughs> That's for sure. A great question. I <laughs> honestly I use the terms interchangeably. Um, I don't like the I I might go so far as to say that an autobiography would encompass like from childhood up until yeah. like present day sort of thing, like so that it's more sort of like a, a big picture kind of that's what I thought of yeah but I honestly I do tend to use the words interchangeably there are people like there are certain writers who are known as memoirists so like um David Sedaris Augustine Burroughs um Mary Carr um like who come out with books that might like not regularly like uh you know like Patterson or Steele like every year or anything but who have several books out that have um kind of like these <laughs> these little snapshots of of their lives like memoirs um maybe that has more to do with it I'm not an expert you guys like yeah, this is the but that's are the there other rules that I I, I don't like to read, I mean, they're interesting, but then I'm always questioning as I'm reading how much is so and how much. Yes, I you should. 
It's the same as when you're having a conversation with a friend and a friend is telling you what happened. And now all of our perspectives are colored by our experiences and our perspectives. So like oftentimes, like if I tell you about an argument that I've had with my husband, then clearly I'm right. And he was completely off base. <laughs> Anyone can do that. Right? Well, well, we know but, that. We, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay. But it's not two it's sides the of the same story. Way when people recount like stories from really um, when, when people recount stories, like they're, they're telling it from their perspective. Some people do a little bit better than others at, at trying to have some sort of uh, form of objectivity or an attempt at objectivity, but. So, so it's the same thing with mysteries and thrillers. I, years and yeah. years ago, and I never read mysteries. And then all of a sudden I discovered thrillers. So. Mysteries um, tend to be a little slower paced uh, and thrillers, like think of thrillers as action movies ish. Um, but again, I think that I'm being influenced in my definition from my perspective as a librarian and how like we'll have thrillers in the fiction section and we will have some thrillers in the mystery section, but the, but just because it's a thriller does not mean it's a mystery. It, to be uh, well it is because you want to know who done it well <laughs> or, and to be honest like, the, happened, i have been or... involved in multiple conversations of like well like maybe we should catalog all the thrillers as mysteries because oftentimes when someone comes to us and asks for a mystery what they mean is a thriller and so it would be nice to have them all kind of in one space Amiga, she's oh. gone tomorrow. okay thank you uh, well, in, oh. the, in the library, I mean, there's this gigantic section that says mysteries. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, it's huge. I mean, rows and rows. Uh, and it's a lot smaller than our fiction section, actually. But where uh, is the in... fiction section? That's just across. I, I yeah. find, well, it's a lot smaller. It looks huge because it's so... It's so obvious, maybe. It's very prominent because it covers like one entire wall. Yes. Um, but then the fiction section, the general fiction section, which then comprises uh, thrillers, romance, um, literary fiction, biographical fiction. Like we don't have everything in like super small kind of sections, but the books that are, or most of the books that are, that are considered thrillers then also have in our library have a little sticker on them that say thriller oh. just to help it uh, leap out to people who are looking for those things well you see because I'm on a walker and I have a hard time you know standing up and stuff and going through so I haven't I haven't really done it yet I usually go into the library I you know I have my own book I still buy books yeah you know? And I have piles of lying on the floor now. But, but the thing is, I have to really get myself around it. For instance, where are the old books? Like, you know, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, these kind of things. Are they in the basement? They should be. There should be some still on the floor uh, of the library because we do have core collections. So while the general rule at our library is that I believe our time frame is 10 years. Uh, it might be five though. If it's older than a certain number, arbitrary cutoff for us, um, then we usually store it downstairs in our stack section. Uh, so that's what you'll see if you're looking on the library catalog and it says closed stack. Now, there are exceptions to that and those are more sort of literary canon or you know classic literature so Dostoevsky I would be shocked if we did not have some on the floor I can't verify today but uh, I will look before I send the link to the recording I'm gonna, <laughs> ask, I'm all gonna ask somebody in the library to sort of guide me through this because you see I'm used to the library in TMR and there everything was really very open and I could always find things and now I'm well, you know, I've been sick and now I can't really walk and everything gets difficult. So I hardly ever go to the library to look for a book. 
because so different libraries organize things differently for yeah. us because we're a one branch library um and we're not really like we are somewhat networked like we do do interlibrary loans which some of you may be aware of if there's a book that you're looking for a particular title that we don't own we can look in other libraries and okay, i know and that because i know in stratford they very often call your library and get some stuff yeah they don't and this have is the other thing too is that because we're a single branch library we save more books than uh, a lot of other libraries so other libraries that are in a branch network they can kind of distribute their books all over the place and then have them shipped from one to the other or whatever without too much kerfuffle whereas for us it's a bit more of an ordeal so we tend to save things and even if they're older we keep them it's just that then you have to ask for them because oftentimes oftentimes what we find at our library is that when the people are browsing, they want to see the things that were most recently returned. They want to see the things that have come out in the last like two years. Um, and then there are readers, of course, who get into one author and then want to read everything by that author. And then oftentimes we're able to accommodate because we actually still have the book. Um, so I'm, that's, that's our, our way of working it. All right. But if ever you're looking for something in particular, and if you're having trouble working the catalog yourself, you're more than welcome to ask staff. That's what we're there for. Are you locking a computer, or do you still have you still have an old cart cat catalog? No, no, we do not have card catalogs anymore. It's all on I know. all digitized. I, I yeah. know. I love yeah. the card catalogs, but I'm a dinosaur. I know. I remember <laughs> being here in university and looking up things in the card catalog yeah, in, the card, in high school but katie when you talk about a memoir or an autobiography like in the one that i read maybe carol with henry winkler they talk about people in their life some of them are are famous some of them whatever and they they recount about this they they'll, sometimes it's negative and sometimes it's positive how do they get away with there's always another side of the story. Did you find that, Carol, with Henry? Like, he may say something nice about, about somebody, but maybe it wasn't so great about somebody else. What about that other person? How do they defend themselves? You know, like, there's no rules or regulations in an autobiography or a memoir. Like, oh, look at the cat. <laughs> well, it's really his perspective. It's his memoir. It's his story. Yeah. But what happens if this the is person it. That, this is it. It sees it differently? You know, like, yeah. well, she they can respond either and... through the press or they can, I mean. Yeah. Well, uh, Rona, I'm going to give you a good example. Brittany Spears' memoir. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. boy. Now, we all know how her father treated her and took control. Yeah. But this is her version of it and mm -hmm. how and how she lost control and couldn't gain it back until she found a very oh. good Jewish lawyer who told her her rights. And so she's do you have to take it with a grain of salt? When oh, you absolutely. Oh, for sure. That's oh, you for have sure. to take it all with a grain of salt. It's not like written in stone. This is just their perspective, right? We were talking about a book the last time, I forget what, and some of exactly. you were saying, well, how did we know what was going on? How could you believe it? And I jokingly said, I believed everything. Do you remember the book? <laughs> it was so funny. Okay. I was... Uh, you know, obviously, you know, what every, not everything was true. So that's how you, uh, you know, you have to read things. And even in the news, you have to weed through what's true and what's not. It's so biased. So what do you want yeah. to believe? I and think that, that's, that's why what... I don't really, I don't pick up books that are memoirs or autobiographies. Oh. Because I, I don't know how true they are. Is it true? Like, can well, I, I, think, I, mean, I, would, like, I think we kind of have I'm to like default. You. What? I think we have to default a little bit to trust the, like, regardless, uh, there's Who's a quote talking? from um, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is that whether or not it happened, they're like, it's true whether or not it happened, something like that. The truth mm -hmm. of it is, is that this is how this person experienced it. This was mm -hmm. this person's experience of this situation. And that still is worth something, I think. So the book that uh, the girl that smiled beads 
is definitely a memoir, right? Because it talks about her feelings when she came right. to the States and it talks, you know, it talks what happened to her on the seven year track. Yes, I think you could say more so of a memoir than an autobiography, but it was, it was she yeah. threw it all in, you know? Yeah, yeah. But you're right. It it was more no. of a, of a yeah. I think you're right. But still, how could so I? I just looked up um just to be again a bit of a nerd about it. I did look up online to see. I'm like, what? What does the online world say? The differences between autobiography and memoir, and it seems like one of the key elements is scope. It's whether it's the whole of a life or part of it. Um, the other thing that I mentioned is purpose. So like what memoirs often convey a particular message, it says, well, autobiography is simply overview someone's life. Um, I might choose to disagree a little bit with that, but I think the main issue is the scope, how, how much of one's life is being examined or recounted. Interesting, yeah. I got to check. Um, well... <laughs> okay. Well, I guess it's my turn to talk about what I've been reading. I've been reading a lot, um, but, and I've been reading a lot of garbage, <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm taking out some of the non-garbagey books that I've been reading. I've just been, I'm, and I'm not going to talk about any of the book club, the other book club books that I've been reading, because I do have a couple of other book clubs. Um, but Two of the books that I wanted to mention were ones that I may have mentioned before because I read them back to back and they've sort of stuck in my mind. And not to be Debbie Downer about this, because I know I was just talking about Miriam Taves' All My Puny Sorrows and it's about suicide. And these two books are also kind of downers. Um, <laughs> they're about uh, end of life. Uh, so um, these two books are Estates Large and Small by Ray Robertson. And We All Want Impossible Things by Catherine Newman. So uh, Ray Robertson is Canadian. Catherine Newman is American. Uh, Catherine Newman's book is sort of, uh, it, it's, it's a retelling of an experience basically that she lived where uh, her best friend was dying and went into hospice. And it's her sort of end of life period. Uh, but they lived in different areas. And so in her novel, she has it that her best friend ends up going into a hospice near her and that she's mm -hmm. the main sort of touchstone, uh, like she's the everyday kind of caregiver presence in her friend's life. Whereas the way that it happened in, uh, in real life was that the, the friend went to hospice with in the tent city with her husband and child. But Ray Robertson's book, Estates Large and Small, uh, there's a secondary character in that also who is terminal and she has decided that she is going to end her life um, at a certain point. Now, she's in the book for most of it uh, and it's her relationship with the main character that brings her into the story. But it's interesting because it's, especially with MAID, uh, you know, medically, medical assistance and dying coming in in Canada, and then that not being available in the States. And you see the ways that these two women's illnesses progress and the differences in the ways that they approach uh, the end of their lives and the amount of agency uh, versus not, there's no, like, I'm not putting any value judgment on either one because it's a very personal decision I think for anyone but it was really interesting to by happenstance I read them back to back I did not pick them up oh. because of the storyline or whatever it was because of uh, you no know, I read like a snippet I, I think I've told you how I often re choose books it's by I open a book at rent something that looks like it's going to grab me, I'll open it at random and I'll read a paragraph. And that if that paragraph grabs me, then I think that's a good book for now. So, wow. and these books just happen to fall back to back. It was really interesting, again, in terms of perspective to see these uh, two characters dealing with similar issues um, and the different ways that they chose to approach them and to confront them. 
Um, I also read Susan Juby's, I'm sorry, Roseanne's not here because uh, I had recommended one of Susan Juby's mystery books to her before. And this is the second of her mystery books that follow a Buddhist butler. <laughs> What's it called again? What's not to, What's not to love? What? The, <laughs> the first book is uh, A Mindful Murder. That was her first one, and I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, it's set in BC uh, at a small uh, little retreat area on an isolated island, and it's sort of like a closed room mystery without it necessarily being closed room. It's also very funny and light and whimsical and weird, and like the, a Buddhist butler. Like, what? Um, she recently, just about a month ago, came out with the second of this sort of, I guess what it'll be a series. And the second one is called A Meditation on Murder. I would skip it. If <laughs> for, for those, I, I like highly recommend the first one. The second one, I was disappointed. And I've read almost all of her other books and have really enjoyed her. I like her voice. But this one felt a little bit rushed and maybe... I don't know if it was a contractual thing. Um, and then the last book that I will talk about really briefly is the one that I just finished. And it's called How to Kill Your Family. Oh, my God. <laughs> you, What are you thinking, Katie? <laughs> I picked it up because I thought it was a funny title. And then I read a little bit of it. And I'm just going to read you guys just a little snippet here and it's from very early on in the book and she's talking about at, she's talking about the uh, American elections from 2016 so, so um, at night when I cannot sleep and my thoughts invariably turn to my life's work that would be killing her family um, I often think of Mrs. Clinton up against that flashy orange moron Whatever her politics, she stood up to a bully who refused to abide by convention or decency. A person like that can drive you to madness without any noticeable exertion while you employ all the strength you have just to hold the line and maintain a sliver of your humanity. That part of the book, and it was, again, just a surprise to come to, but it's like, you know how much effort it can take sometimes for you when you're in a social situation to be to maintain a degree of decorum with someone else who clearly does not care at idiot. all about right. respect or anything else right. and it's true right this idea of like how much energy it it takes sometimes and that's in like I'm thinking of in like the very micro ideas of like interpersonal things I can't even imagine it on a world stage Wow, that that's interesting. Nice. That's a very interesting. You know, you don't think of it. You know, he's an idiot, and everybody, and you can't understand how anybody. You know, but you know that that's a different perspective of just being in the room with somebody that takes it, up so much negative oxygen. Exactly. So it's so funny because whereas he might be, the, or they, whoever this other person might be, the type of person, of course, to say, "Well, you're an idiot," but you're yeah. in a situation where you want to maintain your integrity. And so you can't just say, well, you're an idiot. So what do you do? You lie to your, you, you, it's unbelievable. Or it's you try unbelievable. to find some sort of common ground. And I think, I mean, like, this is what we should do. I think that's, but it does take so much effort sometimes, that emotional that's effort. That's interesting. That's an yep. interesting perspective. That's just Very a little snippet. But I thought it was pretty funny. I, like, I did enjoy this book as well. I like books that have a little bit of, silly especially because the main character she's not she's not sympathetic really like you don't you're not really rooting for her and it's an interesting way to tell a story like mm -hmm. it's an interesting way to to propel the narrative with someone who is not unlikable but at the same time clearly bent right like as and this is something, Rona, actually, while I was reading it, I was thinking of the book that you had loaned me as well. Is again, like this, uh, it's an interesting narrative device to have someone telling the story who you don't necessarily, you don't really agree with. 
they're, they're not trying to make themselves likable throughout the conversation. That's a very interesting. I, I, I would find that very, so she's, she's not the likable person. She herself is not the likable. So what does she, she say about herself? That likable. Like she has her reasons. So with how to kill your family, like she has her reasons for wanting to do what she wants to do. I don't want to ruin it for anyone. So I'm not going to like necessarily give it away. It's, uh, but at the same time, I don't think most sane people would agree that they were viable reasons. You know, it's hard to find viable reasons to murder a whole bunch of people. <laughs> Interesting, <laughs> especially in the political climate in the states now. You know, is a lot of that. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Does anyone else what? have any? I mean, Terry, you and Rona only talked about one book each. I, I, I read. I, I don't. Okay, first of all, once I read a book, I never remember what I really. I don't remember until if someone mentions it, and then I'll start remembering. Um, I I know I have a book club, um, the Midnight Library. Oh, I read yeah, that, that one. Uh, yeah, and we. Did, I read, I mean, I read it, years, but I'm just saying when you, yeah, I, I I forget. So <laughs> I yeah. did not. I didn't go back and try to review and remember because I thought with this I had no idea what we were supposed to do today because I've never been. I just thought we had to bring a book. So didn't we read that with you, Katie, the Midnight Library? Where oh, you had yeah, maybe a year or two ago. Oh, I do. I wasn't yeah, before Terry's time. Yeah, before, before Terry's time. Yeah. What? So, who's the author of that? He's amazing. Who's the author? Matt Haig. Right. Oh, Matt, I love that Matt book. Haig. I thought fabulous. It's that interesting. I didn't love it. <laughs> you it's didn't? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I loved it. So I've read probably around in the past few weeks a few books. But yeah. I don't remember, very honestly. We just go back to the Matt Matt Hayes book. Who said she didn't love it? I could not read it. Terry. I didn't understand the hype of Terry. it. Well, and his what was the book? book? What was it? What what book? What are you talking about? Terry, the Midnight, the, the Midnight Library. Oh, I enjoyed it in the beginning. I liked it. I thought it was interesting. Yeah. The more yeah. I read, the less I was liking it. Right. And he wrote another book, which also didn't appeal to me. He's written a, he's written several. Oh, yeah. well, close to that one. Anyway, I'm glad that I'm not the only one. So <laughs> thank you. I like him. Um, oh, I guess we should talk about next month. Next That's week. what we should talk about. Next month is going to be a traditional book club. And the book is going to be Hello Beautiful. Oh. I've been Tana. trying to read that. Somebody put a damper on it, so I haven't picked it up. But thank you. Well, now I'll read it. <laughs> you, you could leave welcome. one for leave one for me at the front. I will. I'm not going to do it today because no, it's fine. I'll be there often because of my. I want shot. one too. <laughs> you want one too? That's what I was going to say. I'd like to take hands up of who would like a copy set aside for them. Carol, Terry, Rona, Heidi. Okay, all of you. Put Who's Carol Blank author? too. Put Carol Blank. I'll put Carol Blank on it. Who's the author, uh, Katie? It's uh, <laughs> Napolitano. Katie, what was it? Then it'll be May what? Pardon? It's, it'll be. It I'm just ch double checking that as well. May fourteenth. Tuesday, May fourteenth. Okay. So Why I will set copies it? aside for you all. And then I will, when I send out the link to this recording, I'll also mention that that is our next book club book. And so anyone else who would like to request a copy can do so. Why did you, you choose say, that without you know, giving away book? the story? One of the reasons that I chose it, and I'm not giving away the story because I don't really know the story, is oh. that I know that a couple of my colleagues have discussed it and found it really interesting and also okay. my sister-in-law had to read it for a book club and she hated it 
Oh, like, <laughs> I'm really curious. <laughs> oh, that is so funny. Are you crazy Katie, what's about the, your Katie, what's the name of it again? I'm sorry. What's the name it's of it? It's called Hello Beautiful. Okay. It's by I am Napolitano, I believe, unless I'm getting her mistaken, confused with singer. <laughs> I don't think I am. <laughs> yeah, and Napolitano. <laughs> Is your sister-in-law the reason why you like that book on how to kill your family or something? <laughs> oh, uh, oh my gosh. I adore my sister-in-law. Okay. I, I, okay. I, I, okay. I don't have a sister by blood. <laughs> and I am so, so lucky and so happy to have her as my family. Okay, you said you, she hated the book, so you're putting well, it into her. Well, I'm curious because she felt like any time... <laughs> And like we don't always have the same taste in books for sure we live very different lives and all that stuff i love her to pieces we just have different lives right that's interesting but i'm curious whenever something especially when someone that you really like either loves something like crazy or hates it and she felt yeah. really strong about it. so i'm curious <laughs> i'm gonna read it should be interesting sounds good excellent well, then I'm going to stop our recording. Say thank you, everyone, for coming. And I'll see you next month. What's the earliest, just so I know, that you'd have?